Hey everybody, welcome back. We're so happy to be here and I'm here in one of my favorite places. We are in the Atlanta History Center. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera. And we've got some really cool treats in store for you today. And to start this off, let's kick it off with my friend Gordon Jones. He's the military curator here at the Atlanta History Center. All right, well, thanks for that, Gary. We're standing here in front of the Locomotive Texas at the Atlanta History Center. We have 33 acres of grounds and gardens. We have a history museum. We have a research library. We have historic houses. And we have one of the largest Civil War collections in the country. So this is a must-see destination if you're down this way. Now, right behind me, yeah, one of our largest and coolest artifacts. You were already up in Kennesaw and you saw the locomotive general, you know the story of the great locomotive chase. Well, this is the other half of that story. This is the locomotive Texas. And this, by the way, I'm just gonna say, this is the locomotive that actually won the race, okay? <laughs> so here's the thing. Now, when you look at this locomotive though, let's think about it beyond the great locomotive chase because this locomotive was in service from 1856 all the way through 1901, more or less. And during that time, of course, it's just a piece of machinery. And it's rolling up and down the Western and Atlantic Railroad from Atlanta to Chattanooga, hauling supplies, hauling freight, passengers, and doing the work that built Atlanta. And along the way, its parts are all replaced depending on what it needs. So it's got, you know, new wheels, new boiler, new cab, virtually everything on this locomotive was replaced. If you want to see what was original to the great locomotive chase, that's maybe only five to 10% of the whole thing, all right? So that's the frame, the, the structural frame, and probably the bell stand are the only two things that remain from the great locomotive chase. So if you wanted to restore this to the period of 1862, to the great locomotive chase, you pretty much have to build a new locomotive. And we're not even really sure what the thing looked like at that time, although we did find in our paint analysis when we had this restored, some green and blue paint down on that frame. So we don't know what it looked like, but we're interpreting this locomotive right now in 1886 as it looked. It's, the, it's an honest restoration of the sum of its parts. And we put it on the front of the building here at the Atlanta History Center because Atlanta is a railroad town. We were built on the railroad. We have no navigable rivers. It was a railroad that started the city. And Gary, let's look at one other thing that's closely related to that. Yeah, and we won't even touch on all the incredible things you have here at the History Center. We're only going to show a slice, but I do hope we'll show you some of the coolest things. And this next thing is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, this is definitely the cool thing right here. Now look, behind us here, uh, this is what's known as the zero mile post. And we said that Atlanta's a railroad town, all right? Well, this was the, the post that marked the absolute center of Atlanta, the geographical center of Atlanta from which all property boundaries were measured. And that was at the terminus of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. That's how they marked the city. And you can see on the post, all right, you can see in the, in the stone, WNA RR00, the, the actual ground zero. If you look over here on the other side, you can see 138, which is the mileage to Chattanooga. So th this, this right here, for what it's worth, is kind of the, kind of the foundation stone of Atlanta. And, and one of the things I love about the History Center is, look, we're here, we're touching that, this actual stone. You can walk into the cab of the Texas. This is not a stay away facility, which I think is great, Gordon. Exactly, and we, we want people to engage with these kind of artifacts. We want people to understand what that history feel, feels like because we have what nobody else has. We have the real thing. That's what really makes history fun is that you can you feel the real thing. We've got the real thing. That's, what, that's the advantage that museums have. But they also do some tech. So why don't you show us one last uh, thing before we, yes. we wrap up? We, we don't have the real thing in terms of the actual war in Georgia in 1864-65. <laughs> uh, but we do have this wonderful animated map that was developed for the Cyclorama exhibition. And it, it summarizes the war in Georgia uh, from the Atlanta campaign in the spring of 1864 
all the way through Wilson's raid and the capture of Jefferson Davis in the spring of 1865. And it shows this in about 12 minutes. Now Gary and the other guys with the American Battlefield Trust and Charlie Crawford and a bunch of fellows helped us with this. And we hope that it is as accurate a representation of the military movements of the campaign uh, as we can make. Well, super cool, Gordon. I think this is a great introduction, man. I can't wait to see what you have in store for us as we go around. We're going to check out the cyclorama. We're going to check out some of the incredible Civil War exhibit you have here called the Turning Point. And then I think we're going to head behind the scenes a little bit. So thanks so much, Gordon. Thanks to Chris behind the camera. Thanks to the Atlanta History Center. And thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education. Welcome back, everybody. We are at the Atlanta History Center. We are in the incredible Turning Point exhibit. There are more than 1,500 objects in this exhibit alone, so we can't focus on all of them. In fact, we're going to focus on just a handful with the military curator here at the AHC, Gordon Jones. You know, one of my favorite artifacts is also a recent acquisition. Uh, we've been trying very hard here at the History Center to make sure that we tell inclusive history, and that means we need to collect artifacts that were used by black troops and the United States colored troops. That story is vastly undertold, but we're trying to tell it. And the problem with collecting from the United States colored troops is that it's hard to tell what is a USCT artifact and what isn't because they were issued with the same things as white soldiers. So unless somebody put their name in it, you don't know that you have anything. Well, here's an artifact that is an exception to that. Uh, so look at this knapsack right here. And you can see big and bold, uh, the owner, Ezra Brooks, put his name in it, 8th Infantry U.S. Colored Troops. Beautiful. Ezra Brooks was from Ohio, who's listed as a quote unquote laborer. Um, trained at Camp Penn in Pennsylvania. That's where the 8th trained, very famous regiment. But also look at the knapsack. That is not a standard issue U.S. knapsack, Mary. No. Uh, you, you know what that is? Uh, it looks like deer skin or something. It's actually, it's actually calf skin. Ah. And you will recall the story of the um, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts troops early in the war. They ordered 10,000 chasseur uniforms and accoutrements. Uh, when there was nothing else available and they wanted to look extra sharp. Uh, they ordered them from France. The uniforms came over here and half of them were too small because the big American boys couldn't fit into those little tiny French uniforms. So they were all sent back to storage, including the knapsacks. Now it so happens that one of the non-commissioned officers from one of those white regiments uh, was an officer in the 8th USCT. And apparently he remembered these knapsacks, these calfskin knapsacks, and when it came time for the USCT to be issued with materials, he apparently requested that these knapsacks be brought out of storage and they were given to the soldiers in the US colored troops. Now, the other thing we know about this one that's fun is that this knapsack actually saw combat. The 8th United States colored troops went into its first battle in February of 1864, the Battle of Alusty, Florida, and they were rookies. So they didn't drop their knapsacks the way veterans did before going into battle, they still had them on. And we know that because there are references by other soldiers to the 8th and they refer to them as the hairy-backed Negroes. 
only they don't use the word Negro. But the hairy back refers to these calfskin knapsacks. Uh, the USCT, was, 8th USCT was badly shot up at Alusty. They did not get the order to fall back uh, with the other troops and they stood their ground and they fought uh, even though they were shot almost to a man. Uh, but they showed their, their courage and their bravery at that time. Uh, but they also learned a lesson in soldiering, which is use your common sense and fall back. And after that, the USCT, these guys were, the 8th USCT, these were veterans. Uh, they remained uh, in service all the way through 1865. As a matter of fact, they were in the brigade uh, of USCT that chased Lee to Appomattox in the waning days of April 1865. Wow, that's really interesting. And if you haven't been to Olusti, it's, it's definitely worth a visit. Now, before we move on to the next objects, and it's gonna be a little bit of a walk, and Chris White behind the camera will show you some stuff. I just think it's a great testament to Gordon, your acquisitions team and your curatorial team that so much of your stuff is in such excellent condition, such as this piece right here. We try. Good, good. <laughs> Just unbelievable just in those few steps we took since the last object and Chris behind the camera showed you some of those but we must have passed by seven or eight hundred items since then so again you got to come here and see all this but Gordon what do we have here uh, well, we're at the uh, sort of the the uh, defining moment of turning point the American Civil War which is our signature exhibition on the Civil War and this is where we talk about the events of 1864 the decisive uh, year of the war, and of course the year of the Atlanta campaign. And uh, you'll see behind me two flags. Uh, the one over here, you may recall, uh, those of you who are old enough to have watched Gone with the Wind, you will remember the very famous scene in there where there's a Confederate flag on a flagpole and it's near the train station and there's a pan back and, it, and you see the flag flying in the foreground and you see all this field of Confederate wounded laying out on the ground by the railroad. That is a fictional scene, or is it? This flag right here, uh, which is actually a second national flag, what was shown in the movie is just a battle flag, second national flag, and you'll notice that the white field extends all the way over here uh, to the top right corner. And this, this flag was flying over Atlanta on September 2nd, 1864, when the city was captured. And there is a photograph, one of the Barnard images of downtown Atlanta near the passenger depot. And just out, just, just to the side of that image, it's a lot of times it's cut out, is a mast-like flagpole that had to be for a very, very large flag maybe this one, all right? This is actually the storm flag. It's 20 by 10 foot. 
uh, probably made in Charleston. The flagpole was designed probably to house a garrison flag, which was 18 by 36. But uh, this flag was taken as a souvenir by the uh, 4th Iowa Regiment, presented to their colonel. Their colonel later immigrated to Arizona. In Arizona, he had an attack of conscience and he gave it to the local historical society. And then it ended up um, in 1975, uh, the historical society says, what are we doing with this Atlanta flag in Arizona? Did somebody make a spelling error? So <laughs> they um, said, all right, well, who in Atlanta might we find who might want this flag? And of course, they found Beverly DeBose, who was the most prominent collector uh, at the time and in, and in Atlanta. And coincidentally, not related, in an unrelated transaction, the Arizona Historical Society received a $500 donation from Beverly DuBose. That's how we ended up with that flag. The other one, pretty exciting, this is also from the DuBose collection, and this is believed to be the flag that was on Admiral David Farragut's flagship wow. uh, at the Battle of Mobile Bay. Now, this one was in the DuBose collection, and it was wadded up into this little roll uh, with a little silk cover and had a little, a little tag on it. it. says, this was the flag that Admiral Farragut nailed to the mast at the Battle of Mobile Bay. And we're looking at that saying, yeah, right. So we unfolded it, and we began to realize that there might be something to this story. All right? It's a naval flag. You can see the hoist, the rope hoist on the hoist end. You can see that the fly end has been patched. Uh, the, it is where it is tattered on the fly end. Pieces of the flag uh, over toward the hoist side have been used to patch the fly end. It's got the right number of stars for August of 1864. And most importantly, there seems to be no other flag that we could locate that claims this provenance. So this really could be Farragut's flag, but if it is, he didn't nail it to the mast because there's no nail holes in it. <laughs> I, I'm reluctant to admit this, but I confess when I've been here before that I think I thought I was looking at uh, a more standard Confederate flag over there on uh, the left, but what in fact is a much larger flag. I just want to make sure everybody understands that, that that is just a, a small piece. What's that part of the flag called? That just has the... The Canton. That's the, the Canton. Yeah, so the Canton is just that little piece, but that Confederate flag is actually overlapping the U.S. flag here. Yeah, a lot of people miss that. Yeah, I certainly did. So, Gordon, anything else to say? Or are we good? We're, we're good. Y'all, come to see our exhibit. Come to see the Atlanta History Center. We would be glad to have you here. And you might learn something. It'll learn, be fun. Learn something and get, uh, from what I can tell, a really good cup of soup and a really good cup of coffee, even decaf. So, Gordon, thanks so much for having us. Thanks to everybody um, for joining us today. And thank you all for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education. And Chris will show you a little bit more of the exhibit on the way out. Gary, you really need these.